Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. What was on my heart just to say tonight was to just basically remind us all, and I think at times it's good to remind us, isn't it, of what this more beautiful gospel is. You see, the word gospel means good news, and we have to keep making sure we understand if there's anything you ever hear in a religious connotation that's not good news, it's not the gospel. Do you get that? Very important. If you hear something that sounds as though it ain't good, and it's something that's been re, what is it, repeated and like a broken record that's still being played, it's not the gospel. And so I thought tonight we'd just very quickly and especially for those who maybe don't know who we are. You see, The Rock, uh, you know, when, when we come so regularly, we take it all so much for granted because it's what we've become familiar with. And you know what they say about familiarity? It breeds contempt. And sadly, it does. When you are used to uh, this awesome message, you can become quite uh, complacent. And we find, and that's when Anthony goes over to... Um, uh, Australia and sometimes in the, the States, the people who have not heard this good news, when they hear it, it's like, what? What are you saying? But you see, we have it so much now that we can think, hmm, it's amazing. It's like the word am amazing that goes before grace. Grace is okay, but the grace we've come to understand is amazing grace. Do you get it? And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about this tonight. So, uh, I think that more or less in, a, in the country of England and Great Britain, many people have an understanding of what the Christian story is. Wouldn't you agree? It's come from either school or it's come from parents, bedtime stories or whatever. But sadly, we have to say that there are many versions of the story and especially the implications of the story that some have been, like we say, not so good and some are so distorted that it's something that actually, instead of it, people being warm to it, people are afraid of it. And instead of thinking, I want to get to know this better, they're thinking, no, I'm just going to hide. But actually, that's just really so sad. So let's start with what it basically is. It's basically about a love a, an incredible love that you and I can't even begin to comprehend. It's about a love. Say it's about a love. It's about a love. And if any of you say, no, it's about sin and it's about heaven and it's about hell, I'll say, no, it's about a, it's about a love. Now, isn't that good news already? It's about a love that exists between the creator and his creation. It's a love that exists between a father and his sons. We are all children of God. It's about a covenant. It's about a promise that was made before the foundation of the earth and will not be broken regardless of anything. Good news. Now, I know that you know this, but aren't you glad I just told you it again? Come on. We want to introduce this love to you tonight. And it's not about becoming religious or joining a church. Although you might want to come and belong to this because the good news is so good. But once you've understood this love, it's amazing what it releases you into. Because it's not about do's and don'ts. It's not about shoulds and shouldn'ts. You get it? Right? Shall I say that again? Not about do's and don'ts, not about shoulds and shouldn'ts, but it's about a love that is unconditional, that carries the weight, listen, that carries the, the weight of that covenant of which you benefit. You benefit, you don't carry the weight. You benefit. Whoa, I like this already. Sounds good? If I was a salesman, would you want to buy? So we know the basic narrative is that God loved the world that he gave Jesus his son to give his life. 
his death on a Roman cross to save us all. That's basically the line. Would we agree? Do we get it? The basics? Okay. The big question then, if Jesus has come to save us, and we all agree on that, what is he saving us from? Ha! Ah, now this is where it gets exciting because there's so many streams of thought on this and uh, I'm not saying any of them are wrong. I'm just saying that this is how it goes. That the first one is, do you want to put up a slide? I like this. The first slide. And I hope you'll laugh. Please do not be offended. Look at this. Salvation for dummies. Let me in. Why? So I can save you. From what? From what I'm going to do to you if you don't let me in. Now, some of you might feel offended at that. I am not. Because that's one of the versions that's been sold. But that's not our version, right? And I, it's, it's weird, isn't it? Let me in. Why? I can, a lot of people, you know, it's amazing when you're talking to them about this love. And they almost, well, well why? Why? Why do I need it? What, what for? See? It's because the next thing is this. They've been sort of told that they're safe from the wrath of a holy God, right? Oh, so the person behind is saying, hang on a minute, hang on a minute. This God, he gets very, very angry. He gets very cross if we don't come up to a, a, a perfect standard. Is there any wonder they don't open the door? What's the next thing? We're saved from the consequences of mistakes that we've made in our life called sin. It's the right word, isn't it? Right churchy word, sin. It really means missing the mark. It just means making mistakes. Weird word, but anyway. That's another thing that we saved of. What about this one? The fires of hell, where bad people go. Or we saved in order to go to heaven, where good people go. Sorry. Just have a wipe of my nose. But here's the thing. If the wrath of a holy God, sorry, I've lost my place, just a minute. If the wrath of the holy God, or, the, or being saved from the consequences of a sinful life, or being saved from an eternity of hell fire, are what we are being saved from, then we have to say that this God is no different from any go other God that's ever existed. Because every God of every culture has always had those sort of three things you know, that's been it. That's sort of what you have a God for. Do you get me? So what's so different then about the, the God of Jesus, who Jesus came to represent? Now, uh, can you just put the other slide on? Because I like this one. I, I think this was fun as well. There, look, I like this. Now, listen up. I don't want four different versions of this going round. <laughs> Isn't that brilliant? I don't know about the caps. What are the caps about? Oh, that's Westlife, is it? Or whatever. They've joined in. Anyway, so there was something very different about Jesus. For one thing, he didn't point to a God. He pointed to what? A father. Now, the, the reason why that's so important is because in the day and age that he, he, he lived and came onto the earth, those people, those Jewish people, those is Israelites, the one thing that they could not accept was the, the image of God being a father. No, that was just too intimate. That was too uh, presumptuous. And so when Jesus had the audacity to say, do you know you lot, you, you're pointing all these people to God who's demanding so much. Do you know what? He even said of the Pharisees, he, he says, the people you talk to, you make them t twice as bad as they were before you, they started. See? So there was something very different about Jesus. For one thing, he pointed them to a loving father and not a powerful, vengeful God. So I was thinking, and as I was in the shower, I'm saying, okay, well, what is it? What is it then that Jesus came to save us from. And I do agree that, that there, are, there are parts of this that, that we can apply. But if we're talking about this love, this incredible love, what must it be then that we are safe from? And as I was thinking, you know, the shower, uh, the water, the sound, and I start to hear things and convinced that 
you know, there's somebody in the house with me. Um, most ideas tend to be about we save from what happens after we die. And it was interesting that Beth was mentioning about, about death. Because it is, most religions, it's all about, well, you need to put this in place here to, to take care of this here. And as I was thinking, you know, it just came to me in the shower and it was this. What I am saved from through Jesus is saved from a lifetime of worry. And some of you are going to say, hang on, that's not true. Because I've come to Jesus and I worry all the time. Yeah, but you see, Beth said so. She said something. She said, but are we connecting with the possibility of a lifetime of no worry? Because I actually believe that that's what Jesus came to do. And let me tell you why. See, saying that he came to save us from a lifetime of worry doesn't sound very religious, does it? It's not religious at all. And uh, we probably prefer the list that I mentioned above sounds much more serious. And, you know, this is great. We, we want to be safe from these biggie issues, you know, these things. And so me saying it might sound a bit simplistic. But here's the thing. Re religion always, hang on, let me just find where I am. because I forgot, here. Religion never does fully deliver people from their fear of falling short in life. There's always this perfect standard that somehow we're forced to live up to. And then, once we've got through this life, struggling with all of those standards, we then have got to face what is after. But the point is, if we can find the hope here, then we've actually already started the bit here. Do you get it? Life is short. It's unpredictable. We fear living. We fear dying. And most of the time, it's because of what we have been told about the unknown. Isn't that the truth? The unknown. And I'm not just talking about the unknown as in when we die. I'm just talking about the unknown in general. What happens if, 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 if there's a, 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 a financial crash? What happens if there's, there's no more food or there's, you know, or, or, or you have a crisis in your own family or you lose the job, or are you, are you follow what I'm saying? These, these things are incredibly difficult to, to face, and things that we can't control, obviously, becomes very difficult. And we all know of situations where people will say, Do you know, life's just not worth living because it, the, the, the worry, the thought of all the things I have to put in place just to survive. Now, I believe that that's what Jesus came to save us from. Are you going to say, well, that'll have to be a miracle? Well, it is. It's a miracle. Jesus saw the people and what the religions of the day, and I say religions, because it's never just one, you know. There's loads of them, isn't there? The religions are done to them. And what is awesome about this, it says that Jesus wept. Now, he wept over a situation with a person who had, had died. But the point was, even with all the religion that was going on, he saw that even in that situation, it wasn't, it wasn't meeting the need, and he wept. And I'm sure he looks on us all when we think that we've got something together, and we've got a little plan, and we think, oh, we'll, we'll make it work. He, he weeps because he says, no, I want more for you than this. I want it to be better than, than this. I want you to have a confidence and a security that is not found in what you would call materialism or making the grade, but you just have a confidence in the love that I have for you. He said they were like sheep without a shepherd. People wandering around in religious misery, dominated by rules and ritual but no confidence that they were all right, whether in this life or the next. So he says this, he says, watch me. He says, let me point you away from all this religious rubbish and point you towards the love and freedom of a loving father. And of course, the religious didn't like that. And the religious don't like it today because obviously it closes down the business. doesn't it? So anyway, 
The Bible had long told the people what the gods had demanded with all the laws to be kept and the sacrifices to be made. You know, it's easy to say that line, the sacrifices to be made. But if you just for a minute look at the Old Testament and see the amount, we are talking continually, day and night, thousands and thousands of, of animals. And I know animal lovers don't like us, you know, when we talk like this, but Amy's not here now, so it's okay. Um, but the point I'm trying to make is that it wasn't some little nice nice, polite little thing that was going on in some back room. Think about it. It was vile. It was smelly. It was cruel. It was wicked. And it was all in the name of somehow making us look good before God. How horrible is that? And this is why I want to say that we've got a more beautiful gospel because Jesus said, enough's enough. Let's stop all this. So, they killed him. They said, we're not having this man reign over us. We're not letting him upset our, our party. But in his death, he displays the unconditional love of a father, showing how far the, the, far, how far the father's love goes, closing down his, his or, or should I say, our need to put in place, this, this place these rituals ever again. He said it is finished and it was finished. Love Hebrews 2 verse 15 says this, Jesus came to free all those who all their lives were held in slavery of what? Their fear of death. Now immediately you think, oh, well it's just about thinking about the afterlife. No, you see, if you're thinking about your fear of death here, you could almost die tomorrow or die the next day, because it totally obsesses your walk, what you do, how you think, your relationships. So it's, he, that, that verse is saying, you're being freed from the fear of death because it's actually dominating your life. So Jesus' death accomplishes for us a finishness that seems too good to be true. In life, and in death, and I, we love that song, don't we? In death, in life, I'm confident and I'm covered by the power of his great love. And I, I hope this is getting through. I hope you're hearing it because, do you know what? Most of the time, people are in difficulty, not because they lack so many other things. It's because they're actually love deficient, love deficient. And you might think you're love deficient with your partner or your kids or your boss or whatever, but it actually starts because you haven't got the love of the Father that's poured into your being, which then out of that pool touches everybody else. And of course, you've got enough to go around and it comes back because as you give, you receive. Do you get it? So love deficiency is an in in incredibly sad business. And we talk to people who a lot in life who you know for a fact that the reason why they're struggling it's not because of material things it's because they're lacking that understanding that confidence of the love of God for them that unconditional love so anyway let's uh, how come he, he accomplished this for us because it's a one-sided covenant I love this it's one-sided, and you might say, oh, yeah, but surely there's things that we've got to do. We've got to do this, got to do that, the other. In fact, I'm going to categorically say, no, you don't. It's a one-sided covenant, and we know this because in the Old Testament, there's the wonderful story about Abraham. When God comes to him to make a covenant, he uh, technically, the two of them should have made it together. And uh, you don't need to know the detail of it, but basically, they both had to be participants in this. But when it came to, to doing it, uh, it says that God put Abraham to sleep. Now that's interesting. Hang on, if you're going to make a covenant with somebody, you don't want them asleep. You want them awake. You want them listening to the words that are being spoken. But he put him to sleep. Oh, for a minute, think about that. He put him to sleep because he said, you know what? If I even for one minute make this with you and you actually do something, we're screwed here because I can't trust you to keep your side of the bargain. 
Isn't that true? So it's a one-sided covenant. So God made a covenant with him. He woke up to something that existed that had nothing to do with him at all. Now, do you know something? Most of us, we, we, we sleepwalk, don't we, in life? We're so unaware. We're all, we miss so much. And yet, really, the truth is, if we could only wake up right now to the fact that God has made a covenant of love with us while we were asleep without us doing anything about it at all, without our permission, he made that. It's absolutely incredible. It will stir your heart to think, wow, isn't this amazing? And it will empower you to live your life, like I said, without that sense of worry, without that sense of of the slavery of the fear of death, because you will understand this is now to do with me. Because if you, if you didn't make it, you can't break it. Now, it's years since I've said that, isn't it? If you don't participate in that covenant, you can actually break it because you've not made it. And this is what I'm trying to get over to you tonight. This is what you've been saved from, this lifetime of absolute worry because of the covenant that's been made for you. So anyway, the same is for us. We can wake up to something that exists. But then people say, well, surely there's something I must do. Well, we all know, go back to the Christian story that we always said, well, first of all, I've got to admit I'm bad. I've got to be sorry for being bad. I've got to stop being bad. And then, oh, I've got to believe all the right things do all the right things, say all the right things, and go to church. That's about right, isn't it? But aren't all these conditions? So all of a sudden, guess what we're back into? Religion! And fear, and slavery. Because guess what? What happens if in all of that stuff, I get some of them wrong, or I don't quite make the grade? We're back into our held in slavery in life, because we don't know what's going to be. Whereas if we know that none of this needs to be done, we can rest assured that it's already finished on our behalf. So people say, he's not going to uh, just accept people and just, you know, this, this love, and he's not just going to give it to you, you know, without something in return. And let you carry on doing just what you like, is he? Guess what? Because he's made a covenant and he ain't going to break it. And that's, again, such a fantastic thing. Now, we're not saying you're going to be happy if some of this stuff, <laughs> you know. A, one, a one-sided relationship ends up being pretty awful. So the, the, the point is it's nice to actually connect and have uh, things that you're working towards together, same goals, same things, it's great. But what I'm saying is it absolutely necessary. I'm saying no. And let's, the reason why I say that is because I want to look at the story of the, the lost son. And I know you know this story, but I'm just using it as a, a, an, an example. So you get these two kids who live in this incredible house with a father who represents the picture of God in his, in his children. And he says to his dad, right, I've had it. I want to leave home. I want my freedom. And uh, so he asks for his inheritance. And uh, he goes and has a ball. He blows all his money, ends up with nothing, ends up in a pigsty feeding pigs. Now, you might think, well, he's, you know, that's, it's a job, isn't it? But you remember, as a Jewish person, for him to be with pigs was the worst thing that could ever happen. It was just, you had to call it rock bottom. It was rock bottom. So um, here's the thought. I mean, it's just amazing. So who gave him the provision for his escapade? Who gave him the money to go and do what he did? Who? The father. No, don't you think, wow, that's amazing. Why would he do that? It's because you see at the end of the day, you think, well, why would a good father do that? Because the father wants real, not pretend. 
wants real, not pretend. He would rather his son being real out there, spending all the dough, getting himself into a right mess, than being at home and not real. Do you get it? Because if he comes home and he still only wants more money to go back out there and do the same thing again, it still wouldn't, it's not real. See my point? And I actually believe that, that our Heavenly Father is so awesome that basically he says, do you know what? You take it, you be real out there. I am still going to have my covenant with you regardless of whether you're real out there or whether you're real at home. Because think about it, the other son, he was being at home looking the goody two-shoes, but he wasn't being real. You get it? So actually, I think the father was happier about the son going out than the one who stayed in, right? So anyway, let me just say this, because um, I've got to finish, because we've, we've, we've got to be over, so this. Um, so why did he do that? Why did he give him the money to go? And I, I've just written this down, and I'm going to read it. To make it very clear to us, if we will only see it, that the father's heart and the covenant with his son was not based on anything the son would do or not do, whether he came home or not came home, it was all about the father and his love remained and he was still his dad. See, I think if we're not careful, we look at that story and we see the end result and say, ah, but it's because he came home that the father was okay. I don't believe that for a minute because the father was going to be okay anyway. Now, who was missing out? Well, the son was missing out, sat with the pigs. But the son did come home, didn't he? But while he was away, or, and even if he'd ever stayed away, that love was never going to change, was it? It was always going to be there for them. So, in the end, it says he came to his senses and he woke up. He woke up! And we know that he got up and he went home. And I want to believe that he was real when he got back. <laughs> but whatever, his father was not going to change towards him, was it? So, anyway, here's my point. My, I want you to wake up to this incredible love that has been there for you, regardless of whether you're even aware of it. It's there. He's just waiting for you to see it and say, wow. Wow, this is for me, I'm included. You have been saved through Jesus' death, his willingness to, to give himself to a wicked bunch of people who wanted rid of him. He did that in order that you might be freed from a lifetime of slavery to, to the fear of death. And it doesn't matter whether you're good enough, it doesn't matter whether you think you can make the grade, that is the good news. So, this is what I want to end with. I want you to put this little cartoon up, please, at the end. I hope you can read it, because I, I just love this. Um, so, there's, there's God there, and he's sort of pushing out, you know, a newborn. Hope he doesn't hurt himself. But anyway, go play. And there's God there sat reading a book. And then finally, he says, I, I'm back so soon. He says, I hurt myself. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. But did, did, you, did you still have fun? Look at that. Isn't that lovely? So much fun. I had these awesome friends. And there was this girl. And we had kids. And one time we drove all the way to California. And, you know, he's telling all the news of what's happened. That sounds great. Tell me everything while I finish making dinner. What are we having? Isn't that lovely? Wow. Is somebody coming over for dinner? Yep. Everybody. You don't seem impressed. I think that that's amazing. Look at this. Read the bottom bit. I hope you can see it. How I feel about religion. God should be presented as what he is, love and kindness. Stop using his name to justify your race, racism, your homophobia and sexism. I'm not religious. This is what somebody put on, on Facebook. But this comic is flipping adorable. Isn't that lovely? So that's it.
and it's 7.45 and I'm done. What about that? And, and I say with this, I love that and I love what that person has said. It's flipping adorable because the love that we've been offered and introduced to is absolutely beautiful and amazing. So, we just finished. Can, can I just pray over you? And I, and I just want to um, invite you to wake up. Wake up to it. It's there. It is done for you. You are a beneficiary of it. It's just at the moment you're asleep and you don't know it. And if you wake up to it, you will be saved from a lifetime of worrying over the, the, the fear of that slavery of your fear of death. Because in life, in death, you'll be confident and covered. Lord, thank you for this time together. Thanks for helping us. Thanks for just being here with your presence. We, we know you're here. And so I just ask, Lord, that many just take this opportunity just to give permission for that love to dwell in them richly, that they might lose all fear of, of what it might be that they're responsible to attain or achieve, but know for a fact that you are an incredibly loving father who's finished it all on their behalf and that covenant will never be broken. We thank you and we're excited. It's flipping adorable. Yay, we're done. Thank you. Bless you. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all the rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk. And why not support the rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others.